Hello and welcome to another episode of the Viva Bastardo show brought to you by the Haggerty Podcast Network. Today we have an amazing guest. If you like pizza, if you live downtown in New York, then you've probably heard of Scars Pizza, which has become this kind of extraordinary pizza institution. We have, yes, today Scar with us to talk about pre-AMG uh, merger, Mercedes, uh, all sorts of obscure cars and Porsches. And we have a very uh, big bit of news to reveal <laughs> that happens during the podcast. So let's get into it. This podcast is brought to you by AeroVault. AeroVault was designed by Pete Brock, who just so happens to be the legendary designer of the Corvette Stingray and the Shelby Daytona Coupe. It's a car trailer that's made of aluminum and composite materials, incredibly efficient, incredibly aerodynamic. Uh, it's just a beautiful thing to look at also, as it turns out. Find out more at aerovault.com or call them at Henderson, Nevada at 702-843-5320 and tell them Haggerty sent you. No one would have paid what I paid. Oh my God. <laughs> this, you know that too. You know I, no, you know what, man? That is not true. I, um, okay. Yeah. We're still, okay, before we should just. Scar, thank you for coming on the podcast. For those of you who don't know, Scar is a bit of a downtown institution. He started Scar's Pizza uh, on the Lower East Side, which has become like this whole neighborhood extravaganza. Uh, he also happens to like cars. We also have, ha, happen to have a small car, bit of car-related history, which we can get into. <laughs> we can get into later. And you're getting into watches, right? Uh, or you've always been into watches. I've always been into watches. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me, Phil. <laughs> Appreciate what? it. But yeah, I've always been into watches since my old boss, when I was about 17, 18, he introduced me to vintage watches. Right. But I never started a collection because I was broke. So, <laughs> so, you know, now, I'm a, now I have, you know, I do okay for myself now, so I could start and afford. Well, you also, you well, before we get into all that stuff, we should talk, tell people, um, I, know, I know you've told this story before, but I think it's, it's kind of fascinating. I mean, you, Scars Pizza has been, first of all, actually, can I just say one thing? Mm -hmm. Your name enrages me, man. Because with a name like Scar, that's still a legitimate first name. Yeah. And it, I feel R's. like, yeah. what? Yeah, with two R's, but I feel like... Like, I feel like names can make people. Like, you could have no prospects in life, but if your name is something amazing, it's going to suddenly make you famous. <laughs> like, my name is utter shit. Phil. Who wants to be called Phil? No one wants to be called Phil or Philip. It's a rubbish name. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> it is. It's a, I know you being well, we almost We did, almost didn't name our shop after me in the beginning. I didn't want to name it after this. Name it Scar. Okay. Which no one actually knows. <laughs> what so was it going to be called? I have no idea, but we were going to call it Scars when we first started. It so was a it was a friend of mine that insisted I do it. Well, I mean, it it's it's insisted like literally like was like grabbing me. He was like, "Listen, you need to name it this." That your friend, you should thank your friend because it's I the know. most amazing. It's a, it's a genius name for starters, and just was, as, and it's and in I didn't think it was marketable. My my opinion when I first started, believe it or not, I didn't think it, people would take that when, with that name. They're like, "What's the?" But it be. When we started naming it, it created more of a, uh, what's it called? Buzz. Intrigue. Well, yeah. It's, People it, were like, it's why mysterious. Name? It's, well, it's exactly. Like, so no one knew why it was named that. It was like weird. And I didn't see it from that perspective because it's, yeah. So I'm so used to my name. I'm just like, right. I didn't, you know, it's tough for people to like, you know, if your name is Lamborghini, you over, <laughs> like Phil Lamborghini. It's like, oh, well, it's just Phil yeah. Lamborghini. Like, <laughs> well, I, I, I mean, look, having spent a long time in advertising, I can tell you that the name you choose for things, uh, you know, can do so much work on its own if it's the right name. Yeah. Like Viva Bastardo, not to toot my own horn, but that yeah. name already carries a lot of, that does a lot of lifting without having to do much effort. And Scars is the same way, man. It, Scars Pizza is such an, an interesting kind of juxtaposition of two kind of seemingly opposing things. Yeah, I mean... I mean so, I could okay, see so you, you've been going for two years. So do you want to, I know you've told the story, but do you want to tell the story about how you started, why you started... Your, you know, yeah, I know you grew up in New York. In terms of the pizzeria or in well, terms of, of anything? Your entire life, Scott. Just um, regale us, me. <laughs> grew up in New York, born and raised in Manhattan. Uh, hospital, I was born in St. Luke's <laughs> Roosevelt. If you want to go, the well, hospital that's in Seinfeld. That's when they, every time someone got hurt on Seinfeld, they always went to my hospital. That <laughs> okay. was the hospital they used for the sign, all the, every episode of Seinfeld. Right. That's where I was born. Right. And... 
It's in, if anyone's wondering, it's in Columbus, out right next to Columbus Circle. Um, but you worked in a bunch of uh, I worked in a bunch of restaurant restaurants, places, yeah. right? Yeah, then I tried my hand in TV production. That wasn't my thing. <laughs> really? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's a lot of I, organizing. Yeah, I figured out how the whole thing worked. It's it's based on a lot of nepotism. I mean, you got to work hard for the most part, but it's like if you don't have a family member or friend that's like higher up the food chain, you're never. No matter how hard you work, you're always gonna lose out to the guy that's sleeping in the in the production vans because they're you know their dad's friend is right. I was like, this ain't for me. <laughs> so I, I stopped that quick. The money wasn't bad, but I just I couldn't do it anymore. But the but did you? When you started working in restaurant business, because you worked at a bunch of kind of happening places, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, my first restaurant was uh, Blotto's. Everyone knows it now, but at the time, it wasn't really well known until only at night. It was like one of those real New York spots where only the people downtown knew about it right. at the time when I worked there. Right. I didn't know about it. So what happened was one of my best friends that I grew up with, um, his mother used to be the general manager of Lombardi's when it was actually, you know, a hot popping spot too. Right? Right. This is like 1990. 99 around there and I was you know dropped out of high school troublemaker and I was like <laughs> she wanted to help me out I was like listen I need to work I need like real work <laughs> like I can't be on the streets like this anymore and he they didn't want to hire me because we were so close they didn't want to hire me at Lombardi's I, I understood and I was kind of a little upset about it I was like you know what I could hey but they didn't want to take the risk of like you know like you working with us you know it was you know whatever but the money was really good. I knew the money was like really good because they were always busy lying down the block and everything. I used to order time. from there in the late nineties. It would always yeah. take like an hour. It was. It was every night. We used to have three phones. It was just before, just before like Uber Eats and all that stuff. So right. you would literally call it in. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. phone up. No credit card, cash yeah. only. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and it was we. It was like I used. To, I first started working the phone when I. Well, we'll get to that later on when I got older. I ended up working there at some point. Right. So. They were friends with Emilio. Emilio just bought the restaurant from the Bellotto family. And he was, you know, he owned the restaurant. So I walked in. She's like, listen, you got to give this kid a job. Whatever you got, give it to him. Get him off the streets. <laughs> and that's literally <laughs> He's what going I'm. crazy. And, you know, Emilio gave me an opportunity. He was like, yeah, I'll give, you'll be a bar, a bar back. Oh, not a bar back, I'm sorry, a busboy. Right. I was, you know, 17. So you started the, you started the top then? Started right, way at the top. <laughs> right. I worked my way down. Never all the way <laughs> all down, all the way owning down. your own joint. So, <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, he gave me a job. He was teaching me the old, I, I started like making the, he serves a table bread that's really amazing, like a focaccia. He taught me how to do that, like prep it every day. Like, this is how you make it. Like, he was a, he's a gruff dude, but he's a really big hearted dude. But were you interested in food? Like, was at the time not real, no. So it was just a job. It was just a job for me. Yeah. Right. So I was just like, then I just, I was like, oh, this restaurant's cool. And that, the one thing I really hated now that I remember, I have to wear a tie and a button-up shirt. <laughs> they don't do that anymore now. But <laughs> back then, it was a tie and button-up shirt. Right. And I'm like, real or clip-on? I did both. <laughs> <laughs> but I would leave it like I didn't know how to tie a knot, so they would do it for me. I would just loosen it, take it oh. off, and hang it. And when I went back, they would just tighten it again. Yeah. That's the way to do it. Yeah. So that was like, or then I had a clip on too. So, so that was a, but that was a, that was a kind of a happening place, like a, a lot well, of cool check, people. I didn't know this at the time though. Right. So lunch was dead, always dead. Like mm -hmm. at the time, like nobody walked in their lunch. So I would work at lunch, and yet one or two customers, Emilio's friends would come in, and that's it, or, and his partner at the time. Then at night, completely different story. You would see, I would, who did I always, you would see always a celebrity. And I didn't know this. Besides that, the food was amazing. Like, it was like, I'd never had really good Italian food out on the street. That was the first time I've ever had Italian food. That was amazing. Like, like a New York style, like American style. Not, right. not the stuff you guys, like, what you go when you go to, like, Puglia and, like, eat you know, <laughs> on Tuscany or Tuscany. Not, right. not, not the fancy All, stuff. Not the like, stuff you get from Olive Garden. No. <laughs> not at all so we went so I got into it he so at night when I started working nights I was like wow it's like Iman it's like David Bowie I was like holy shit. right Lenny Kravitz like right. this is when they were all like huge stars too it was like 98 99 and I was like yo this is like what did I step into <laughs> you know it was like it was it was awesome I was there for a whole year a little over a year I think yeah more or less and then at the same time, you remember Pravda? That yeah, 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 downstairs. Yeah, that Russian. There was a for for those that Russian get, spot. Yeah. For guys who don't know, for people who don't know, Pravda was a Russian. Was it? It was just a bar. It right? was a, but it was a Russian themed bar. Like yeah, it was a It was one of the first actual cocktail bars. In That's the city. right. Remember that in the yeah, city, yeah. like 
The, yeah. 20, the first like, you know. It was on, it was on uh, Lafayette. Lafayette. Yeah. And you'd go downstairs yeah. and it was, yeah, it was the whole thing. So they were, they probably, the, so the people that worked at Providence and did the cocktails actually spun off to employees only. Those all, like, all those dudes were like the employees only crowd. And then everyone, when they first opened up, it was, it was the first also private, at, like private party. Like who you, if you didn't know anyone, they wouldn't let you in. Right. You know? yeah. I was like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> I was like, where am I going? So wait, hang on. You were working For a bar. There? No, 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 no. We used to hang out there. Oh, with Emilio, see. he used to drag us. I, I was 17. He used to drag me and the chef. He was like 19. One of the, you know, one of the, we used to drag us into Pravda with him all the time. So you had this real, I mean, you had this kind of incredible, you were sort of inserted into the very heart of downtown. Of downtown, New York yeah. This life. is when Pastis was hot, like right. McNally restaurants and all this other stuff. And I yeah. was like, you know, I never was a person that inter, like interjected myself into these situations. I just, I was always in the shadows. I'm always like, I used to, you know, mind my business, take in everything because it was something new for me. I used to hang out uptown all the time. So it was right. like, for me, downtown, my cousins used to come. I always knew about downtown because they called it the Ville. Right. That's when we right. were growing up, there was no Nolita. There was, there was like the Ville. Uh, so, not even Soho, I think. <laughs> it was the, all that was the Ville. Tribeca was kind of new because JFK Jr. and De Niro made Tribeca. They was right. like, no, I didn't even know what they called it before they called it Tribeca. Right. Um, there was meatpacking. Was it meatpacking? I think it might have been meatpacking. Meatpacking existed. Yeah, meatpacking existed. Because, that, because those were real neighborhoods. Like meatpacking was where yeah, there was no Chelsea. Happened. It was like meatpacking. Yeah, uh, there was none of that. Because it's actually interesting to think about how you're you're right. Like to think about New York in the '90s before it became like <laughs> it was sort of before brand- September 11th. Well, like, also, yeah, and before it was sort of branded by real estate uh, people. It was just kind of downtown, the village, or Alphabet m- City, Alphabet City meatpacking, meatpacking, Chinatown, Little right. Italy, and that was, it, well, it was Lower, East, was no, Lower East, like El- Lower East Sida, and that yeah. was it. The land we used to call it the Lansing. When yeah, we were growing up. Because when I Sida. when I went to buy my place on the Lower East Side, I remember the, the real estate woman was like, "Oh, I'm going to show you this place in Loho." <laughs> she said, call, they called it Loho. Yeah, I was like, "What?" She's like, "Yeah, Low House." Low, and I was like, "I said," like, and it was I'd never heard that. They term. probably called it Loho because they just named it Soho and Noho. Exactly. Probably that's no, what, that's exactly it was right. first. It was Soho, then Noho, then yeah. they were trying to call that your area. That's Loho. exactly what that's I was doing. Yeah. yeah, it didn't stick. Loho yeah. didn't stick. <laughs> but I remember <laughs> thinking, "Wow, that's new." Yeah. Now we got uh, two bridges. Now that's the newest neighborhood in that neighborhood. Is that right? That's new. Oh right? yeah, that oh, two, right. which Chinatown, but they call that area two bridges. They're trying to gentrify that, right. that area, Chinatown. So anyway, so you, so when do you think? Um, when do you think you? Sorry, I'm going all over the place. No, 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 that's I'm good, man. To, no, it's it's all it's all it's interesting. It's all interesting, man. Yeah. When do you do you remember when the first time you you thought, oh, I I might want to, like, when food kind of meant something to you when that when was you... Bellato's was the it first was. spot yeah okay and then Lombardi's afterwards I ended up I left Bellato's went down to Miami to try it out for a year or two came back um then I started working in Lombardi's when I came back when you sorry try Miami just like as a city my parents moved, ended up moving over okay we had an issue up here and they had to leave <laughs> so they moved, moved to Miami <laughs> So what, uh, like a Skittles-colored Lambo mesh crop top <laughs> shirt? That's what you were doing. That's my around. uncles and stuff. Aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> that was so but, okay, so back to Lombardi's. So um, I ended up working in Lombardi's, and then that's when I fell in love with pizza because I've never had at the time Lombardi's. Honestly, when people don't, you know, they might not find this. They might they might find this hard to believe, but it was actually the, probably the best pizza in the country. I remember, man. It was I, amazing. I used to order, and I fucking loved that pizza. I remember, if I remember correctly, the, the pepperoni was really round. And they it were was the, kind of cupped, and there would always be a little bit of yeah. oil in the pepperoni, and it was so. So they were the first place to make pepperoni, that style of pepperoni. I've never seen it before. They were the Lombardi's was the first that, to do okay. it in New York City. I know Buffalo. Everyone, the pizza purists, would be like, oh, but it's then Prim, then Prince Street actually super popularized that to the point that their business is based around. Those pepperonis now, which is what is insane. that like a special like they is that something they source from Italy or they, no, no it's American it's Rosa, so what, what Gra- Rosa was, Grande it's from from here what 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 was it about pizza what, what what did you fall in love with I just you know what it was for me it was like work when I started working I worked the phones for a few months and I started working as a server and I was probably it was just probably like just seeing all the different people walking into this pizzeria. Like you, we would have the Con Ed guys come in after a graveyard shift. Right. They go drink at at uh, Spring Bar <laughs> at eight. I was like, who are these people drinking at nine in the morning? Like <laughs> drinking hard. And it was the guys coming off their graveyard shift from Con Ed. Right. And then after that, they eat. They wait for us to open, and they come into Lombardi's and eat lunch. Right. 
you had them, you had the neighborhood people, like a bunch of artists still lived in Olita. It wasn't a bunch of rich people. So, so was it? So it wasn't. Was it less the food and more the people that it attracted? The whole, the the whole. I just there was so many different people, like walks of life that from like different backgrounds that would go to Lombardi's, and it was cool. It was like, and everyone had a great time. Well, you know what's really lovely about what you're saying, man, is that um, pizza is weirdly democratic. It really is. Like, it really. Is. I mean, is it? I mean, really. That's, I, if I feel like no one dis who who dislikes pizza. That and just it's just every it, the price points at a point where it's it attracts every person from every walk of life like yeah. always and that's the be- that's the thing that caught my attention to it right I was like it's affordable for families to come and eat a pie it's affordable for someone to just come by himself and eat a slice like you know I was like this is what I want to do this is awesome so the, is that do you think that's that's when you when you thought you'd want to have your own slice shop. Not yet. <laughs> that was late <laughs> at the time. Yeah, I didn't. I knew I wanted to own my own business, but at first I wanted to do a Spanish restaurant for my mom. Yeah, you know that never. They're, they're like no one was ever behind that one, that idea. And then I fell in love with pizza when the guys when I worked in Lombardi's. I was like, all right. After a while of being there, I was like, I want to open up a pizza. That's what I really want to do in life. So I figured it out. I so like, how long? So between the the that desire like you between you thinking okay i want to open a pizza place how long did it take to it took me almost eight years eight years to open it up from that point right i just never had the money for it so (laughs) i was like no and then i started saving money and then i found a couple friends that are investors and they put in money into it and that's it and then we ended up we almost didn't open though like the so my best friend that i grew up with that i was gonna partner with originally the guy that worked in the bar we were supposed to do it together twice, and he backed out twice. When did you guys open? Uh, 2016, March 1st. Right. We had a soft opening in the February just to get the kinks work the king, and I was working. See, you know what's yeah. funny about that? <laughs> I would remember, because I've, I've been living on Orchard since 99, I'm like the old geezer of the neighborhood. Okay. So I went over there. I think I've told you this. I went there when you first opened, and I was like, oh, this doesn't taste so great. Right. <laughs> well, the reason Cause, being, cause you, you were trying. Stuff. I was trying stuff out still. So and people don't. People don't. You know. Yeah, and I was like, oh, and then and then our mutual friend Magnus said to me, oh, you should go to Scars. It's really good. I was like, really? And so I went down I there, that. and I went down. And I was like, he dragged you over. Yeah, yeah he did. And, <laughs> I I went, I was... and, and I went down. And I was like, holy shit, this pizza tastes fucking amazing. Yeah. What's gone? What's happened? So I, I must. <laughs> you have... said that. <laughs> no, you said you must have put too much oregano when I had it the first time. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I like, it why tasted like it was all. <laughs> I don't know what it was. Uh, that's funny though, but yeah, no. I mean, what's the address again of the place? Just so people know. Uh, the the so we're moving to a bigger space across the street. So the current space is still twenty two Orchard, and then the new space is going to be thirty five Orchard. Right. But the old space is a uh, it's a front, right? Uh, of course, yeah. <laughs> I pay people to stand in line all day to make it seem like it's busy. Uh, just so people know, I was looking. It's very I, expensive I, to do all that. I was I was looking into Scar. On, I was looking at the you know, interviews of Scar. I, I like to research people, and there was some people. There was some guy talking about how it was a front. I'm, but front for what? Like you were running selling like, drugs and stuff. Right. <laughs> I've heard stuff about selling drugs in the shop. So giving away drugs too. I do like, like that's I, not a that's not a business where you give away <laughs> drugs. It's well, I mean, a, I think you don't make, really make money in that. You're. Um, the cocaine infused vegan Caesar, I think, is amazing, man. I do love that. Yeah, that's that's a that's a spe- everyone loves that. <laughs> they keep coming back. Everyone home. loves it. So the vegan Caesar that we serve, it came into it came into fruition. So I became friends with this dude Gerardo. I used to work at El, El Rey, like a vegetarian spot. We're still cool. We're still good friends. We're cool family. So I was like, listen, man. I was like. I love the stuff we do here. If I ever open up my own space, we were living on Rivington, my wife and I, Megan. I was like, if I ever open up my own space, I was like, you need to do a salad on the menu. Like, but I did it as a, you know, I was a gesture. Like, we we need a salad anyway. I'm not a salad person. So yeah. Do you mind? I was like, he was like, yeah, I'll do a few, no problem. Wait, I'm sorry, I'm lost, man. Is this guy like the salad king of the Lower East Side or something? Not, he should be. He's he's <laughs> super talented. The people in the food know who he is. It's like he's extreme. I just met him because I was like, this place is tiny. It was on Stanton Street. I lived on Rivington. My wife, we were dating at the time. So I was like, oh, this is an interesting space. They started off as a, I remember they started off as a coffee and wine bar, didn't go anywhere. And then I see a guy Gerardo, building this little shelf to cook behind inside this place. And this place was already the size of this place. This is super tiny. So I was like, you know what? I'm gonna go try it out. Just because I went to go try it out, it just opened the whole whole, whole like Pandora's box of friends that I'm with now. Just right. just for me walking in there, be like, I'm. A, 
I'm going to give this place a shot. That vegan uh, Caesar is mythological. My wife's obsessed with it. Yeah, it's really good. It's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's just... Is, <laughs> it's just... He's a talented chef, you know? So, so you, okay, so how did you end up, though, um, picking Orchard Street? I mean, you kind of... I, I feel like... I, I used, I used I to hang out there a lot. My, okay. One of my friends, one of my good friends, he lived on Ludlow Street. He had a loft on Ludlow Street, and we used to, I used to always... From like early two thousands, all I used to always be down there. Like, they had a restaurant, Les Enfants. They had Guild World when they first opened. I used to go to you, Guild World. I mean, you really saw the whole neighborhood change, like I did. Oh yeah, I remember. At night, we used to go. We used to live on Ludlow, right, Metrograph, Ludlow between Canal and Hester. There used to be the Chinese bodega on the corner. Yeah. And then I remember every time we went to his part house, the party or whatever, brought girls over or whatever. It was <laughs> always. You couldn't walk on the sidewalk at night. There was so many rats. You had to walk in the middle of the street and then keep your eyes peeled. If people don't remember, keep your eyes peeled. Walking down the middle, because there was no traffic either. So it was like, right. you just walk down the street, make sure you wouldn't see rats. And right before you got to your building or wherever you were going in that neighborhood, it, you would throw stuff at it to scare the rats away from the front of the building so you could walk through. Like, I wasn't scared of rats, but I didn't want to step on them. One right. way. <laughs> it's funny, actually. People, Chinatown used to be like that, too. People don't remember, but, yeah, I mean, early 2000s, it was a ghost town down there. Was there was nothing. Town. There was nothing down there. And my the, my best friend from the Lombardi's, his mother used to live on Elizabeth and, and Grant Street. Okay. So that was a ghost town, too. Yeah. So I remember her. the building was so <clears> old, but in the hallways were so narrow. So you would walk in the building. It was just literally a straight shot, right, off of Grant Street. And then the garbage room, the garbage room was just three garbage cans stacked on top of each other full of rats. <laughs> and then you, just, like and you have no option to go to the staircase. It's right there. So we would always be like, ding, 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 like <laughs> coming down the hallway to scare the rats and stomping. So they, it, was, it was like a rat con. Because we didn't want the rats to jump at us. Because they, right. they would, they jump on people don't know that. If they're elevated, they'll, they'll, if, they, if they feel threatened, they'll jump right at you. Really? Oh, yeah. You never seen that? <laughs> no, I've never been, I've never been attacked by a leaping rat. They will. If they feel threatened, they will. So we scare them off by movement, and they just, they're smart, so they just leave. You know why? Because I'm not threatening, man. <laughs> I'm like a tiny, skinny English geezer. <laughs> You're a burly gent. They weren't scared of me. <laughs> <laughs> the rats are not scared of me. I feel like New York rats are not scared of anyone. They're not. So, so you felt that, um, did you feel that the Lower East Side was going to turn into something, or you just, were you just uh, sort of, I I always was connected to I like I love downtown like I've been living I moved up I moved from uptown to downtown like twenty years ago so it's like I always love the energy down here I always love coming down down like downtown for me it's like it always was like this mecca of like everything you know right and it was weird you meet the best <clears throat> people you meet the weirdest people you meet the coolest people you know it's not it's different from brooklyn different from every area of the, of the city even up like up, like uptown has its own special space like it's a special place there too as well. even though we share the island it's still right the middle is whatever <laughs> <laughs> but uptown and like that middle of, yeah i mean the mid middle, of manhattan. The middle of manhattan is this weird kind of i still like i still like midtown i like rockefeller i like like mid, like the, the landmark areas I, I still love like the rink i like you right. know what i'm saying i like columbus circle i like the park like. but you're right though there's something there's something there's something always peculiarly beautiful and interesting about um the kind of gravitational pull of downtown new york for eccentric people for people who don't fit in for artists for or, do you think that's still happening or not so much no no not at all where have no. all those people gone Upstate, <laughs> Woodstock, know. Woodstock, Thailand. I don't know. <laughs> they live, now with the internet, they just go anywhere they want. Now. Right, that's true. With the you know, social media. And so you you started your you started scars um, two years ago. Yeah, um, six years, seven years. Oh, oh sorry, seven. sorry, sorry. Yeah, six in sixteen, years. in sixteen. But but within, I'd say probably within a couple of years, it was like an institution. I mean, didn't you get voted like you know best? Best life pizza yeah. in that was history. out of nowhere because we don't people think we pay for PR and like I like we don't pay for we've never paid for PR we've never had anything it's all basically all word of mouth like we don't even post on our Instagram like we don't do any of that I like I, I like think, people I still discovering like, it that's what I feel like and right. it works both ways it works both ways too because a lot of people think you know the people that hate on the show because you're always gonna have haters the more successful you are there's nothing you can do about it. They'll say, "Oh, it's you know, it's hype or overhyped." They, we don't do anything. We are like, whatever people were in the same competition. They go overboard. They post reels. They on TikTok. They do this. We don't do nothing. 
Like literally nothing. <laughs> I, feel, I sort of feel like in some we ways. We post in a, like once in a blue, like we just did a pop up in Tokyo, June. And we, you know, we lit, no one knew about it. We literally posted it like three days prior to the, <laughs> the date in Tokyo. And then it was just the first day, even the owner himself, the owner of the place that we were popping up in. Right. It was such a crazy, like, you know, a crazy, it was crazy. It was like four hour wait. Through. People were lined up. It was a huge, people were lined the hell up. It was, it was crazy. I was like, this is absolutely, for something that we didn't do an email blast for, we didn't do none of that. It was amazing to see. I was like, people love this shot that much. It's awesome. And it was something, and I wanted to do it in June or May in, in, in that time because it was still, the borders were still closed in Japan. Just to give the youth over there something cool. Like, I was like, <laughs> the just, youth. Yeah, I was like, let's do something cool for them out there, you know? Because <laughs> let's they, give you know, something to the youth. <laughs> but no one was doing it. I was like, now's the best time to ever do a pop-up in Tokyo, in Japan. Let's, like, let's do it now during their lockdown. I've got to say, man, you've got and it balls. Worked great. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> it was the best decision we ever made. I mean, this look, there's... It, I sort of feel like the, the, I mean, this is probably a bit of a cliche, but the, the most authentic things are often the most effortless things. Do you know what I mean? Like the, if you don't put, if, you, if you're not spending all this money on marketing and, and design and well. I'm not, know, against, I'm not against that stuff. No, I know it's just for, my, for me personally, things I'm involved in, like I don't, like specific, if it doesn't make sense to me, it doesn't make sense. If everyone, I've always been an outlier. Like I've always like, if everyone's, abusing IG, putting a photo of pizza, burgers, and dogs every time. I don't want to do that. Like, <laughs> let's do something, and you're in market. You're a contrarian. I'm a contrarian. Like, I don't want to do that. Right. At all. Like, if people are posting, I'm tired of, like, the algorithm, Instagram, or TikTok. If you click on something that's watch, food, pe whatever, it's just, your feed's going to be full of that. So I was like, I don't want to <clears> be mixed <throat> in with everyone. Right. You know? So it's like, plus, I don't think people want to see a photo of pizza every day. Some people do. I'm not gonna lie, but then most I've I don't. Got to, I've got to say, man, I find I find um, <laughs> I always find pictures of food like weirdly unattractive. It's it, I don't like it. <laughs> it makes me not want to go to these spots. Is like, there any food that looks good in photographs? No, only in cookbooks. But what like, a, okay, what about cookbooks? Uh, look great. What about like a donut? Yeah, I'm not no? into that. You don't think of like a do you you don't like donuts? No, I do. I love. I, love I, like, I go to Donut Plant all the time. I love it in our neighborhood. What's your favorite over there? The they have a bunch. They the, tres, creme, the creme brulee. You have the tres leche cake donuts. No, that's too much dairy for me. I'm not, <laughs> I can't vanilla remember. bean. Vanilla bean's great. The you know blueberry what? one's good. Vanilla the, bean's good because it's chewy. Yeah, the vanilla bean one is good. Uh, the creme brulee is my favorite. <laughs> it's just different. You don't. You can't find a donut like that anyway. That's right. Okay, so. Now you've started this place. It's a neighborhood institution. Uh, pop up lunacy in Tokyo. Um, tell me a little bit about uh, cars, because I know <laughs> we're edging closer to the big story, Scar. <laughs> <laughs> so the reason why I'm even on here. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's the only reason well, I'm here. It's the reason, gonna... it's the reason we're friends-ish. <laughs> yeah. So, well, first of all, you've you've been into cars since you were a kid, right? Always, yeah. And didn't you? dad have some interesting cars? My dad used to have a, a, used to be, I don't know if he was involved, he had <clears> friends <throat> with people that used to steal cars all the time, so. They used to steal the wildest shit, I would see the, and I didn't know at the time, they had Audi Quattro, like the rally, the UR, like, and I was the like, what is it? Yeah, what is this car? This is so <laughs> weird. They used to have it out, they had everything, and they used to go, like Miami, the original Miami Grand Prix, they used to fly to Miami, go to car vets, they, they used to go to the tracks and Poconos race with sea races all the time, they used to drag us all the time. So what car did you grow up with? Uh, my dad had a 240, uh, a 280ZX, a 74. Okay. It was beautiful. It yeah. was like, it was, it was amazing. It was <laughs> like powder blue, it had the clear headlight covers on it, it had the, you know, this, this back window it was all cool. It was like Kenwood stereo. I remember all this. this <laughs> black leather. It was really cool. And he had it like lowered and like right. super fast. They did engine work on it. It was one of my, one of, that was my favorite car that he's ever owned. So has he had a bunch of different cars? He's had a bunch of different cars, yeah. The one thing about my dad, he, he loved cars because he never took care of his cars. <laughs> like he never, <laughs> he like trashed his stuff. Like, <laughs> so like he never took it. He was not, a, like he knew how to work on cars. If there was an issue, boom. If, like maintenance, he right. doesn't do, he never did maintenance on his cars. So what was the, what, what until did, he got older. What did you start buying when you could start buying cars? The cars I've always loved growing up in New York were Volkswagen GTIs and the Mark IIs. Always loved. Those are the hatchbacks. What's wrong with the Mark I, man? You know, that was my first car. My dad had a rabbit. 
So, yeah. Yeah, he had a four-door rabbit. Yellow oh, one. wait. They didn't make a four-door. They did make a four-door rabbit. What? They did? Yeah. Wow. He had a rabbit four-door. So what was the Mark... Why Mark II versus Mark I? Because it was my era. It was like oh. Mark II, Mark III. <laughs> okay. like, was, so Mark I was like old geezer car. Geezer you want car to... first, yeah. Oh. Mark II and threes were... were it's, and Mark II and threes were the ones that everyone in the street was like modifying with like... Recaro seed. They would get their own customized Recaro seeds, like throw money on the cars, throw rims at BBSs, drop them, make them loud and fast. It was right. great and put a huge system in the car. <laughs> those are those are the cars I fell in love with. My cousin had a 300 ZX, brand new, turbo. Uh, but don't you have, you have a little bit of a penchant, a penchant for like the Giza mobiles. The old, uh, like, the, mean, like Mercedes. Sedans, I, right? Yeah, I mean, I have an affinity to the bubble, the bug eye Benz, because it was the first time Benz ever made the run, right. and everyone, like everyone that I knew that I looked up to, had one. Really? Yeah, they were the only like street people all had like. Yeah, God, I can't, I can't come around to the round eye, the those round bug eye. Uh, they Benz were the only model. They that was their first model. With, I mean, they came out with other, but they I, started making them like oval, look like roaches now. Like I didn't like. <laughs> I like the ninety nines. The 2002, 2003. I love the... Um, the W210s are... The, the bricks. Those, you know, the bricks they were making in the late 80s and the... Uh, and yeah, 90s. you like the W124s and stuff. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. I love those too, but it was like everyone had one of those. It's like... Like, the one I loved out of the, the square ones was the... I don't know which model it is, but the S600s. Because I saw, I saw Jay-Z owned one. <laughs> I was up in the street. Uh, Cameron, this other rapper, owned one as well. It was like a status symbol in the hood. Like, right. if you had an S600, they were $100,000 cars. That, that was huge back then. That was sure. a lot of money back yeah. then. Yeah. So I was like, and I loved how it was two tone. It was like that black pearl. And then and the black, plastic cladding or something. And then the right? plastic gray cladding. And yeah. the cladding would match the interior. It was yeah. like, it was cool. I was like, I, these cars I, are really I cool. kind of, I really want, as I'm approaching, you know, Pete Geezer, I kind of want to have one of those cars. Oh, you'd love it. Yeah. My 90, so basically, my W210 is really a W124. The chassis is just the sheet metal is different. Right. And a lot, and but you have a massive knowledge. Like, you're the full peak internet weasel of all, love, those, all those obscure, I, like, AMG you know what it is? I like the pre, the pre merge. I'm a huge pre merger AMG guy. Before the merge, like, their stuff prior to that was incredible. Like I was telling you about the pre merger, like they didn't even they didn't no one really knows this unless you're an AMG geek, but they had an AMG division, Japan division, and those cars are like, they're not like no one knows about. It. Like even you did, I was like, no, they had, they just never. What was I don't, the name of that guy? The, the 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 special. There was a name of some person who does was signed the engine and all the stuff. The, it, it would depend who's. It, the, no, remember we were, we you showed me, we were at that car show at the car park. Oh, thing. Tommy Kiara. Yes, yeah. he so, does JDM stuff, but he so, did. He also did a, a 190E. He did, and I showed you photo. You, yeah. No one believed. Me. I was like, no, he built. He actually. But wait, Tommy Kiara is who? He's a Japanese car builder. For J, he does mostly Nissan, like okay, so he's like he, he was like R32s, R33s, R34. Oh, so he's he was almost he's like an RWB. After aftermarket he's, guy, yeah, but he didn't do crazy stuff, but he would put his branding on everything from the shift knob to the right. steering wheel. I was showing you the glove box, <laughs> yeah. the the sun visors had Tommy Kiara, the seats had Tommy Kiara, right. and his badging would be everywhere. And right. he just they'd tune the car, do whatever little, and everything was not the same kind of. They, you would see certain ones ever the same, but he wouldn't design everything or build anything just the, exactly the same as the next car, right? Which is I thought was kind of cool too. I just like that he just put. Cause you know how modest Japanese people are. Like they, he just like I know. Oh, fuck that. <laughs> Put he's my like, name on he's, everything. He's like the automotive Donald Trump of Japan. <laughs> he is. That's probably good. except maybe uh, yeah cooler. So <laughs> like any like I was if you're looking if anyone's like looking for and I'm blowing up everyone that, that I personally think that I'm going to anything that's pre merger AMG Japan from the G wagons the G36s the the W124 is whatever you could find. Those are probably because they like even though they're not hammers, those are the closest thing to hammer. Like if you find the W124, like we were look when I was showing and that that gray one. Yeah, yeah they'll come with all the bits of an AMG. The engines will be modified, but not it wouldn't be a V12 or whatnot. But you'll you'll find V6s that are modified to go faster and stuff like that. But those are the closest things to hammers now. The like, hammers are twelve, right? Yeah, was it? So, yeah, ten or twelve. I don't remember. I mean. What, did they make? Did they not make? I don't really know much about the hammer. The hammer. It's like they didn't, they, they didn't make. They didn't make them. Any okay. Hammer. I mean, that is the. I feel like that. That is one of the world's greatest names for cars. Yeah, and I'm, to see, I could have bought one for if I for ten percent of what it cost. Now. <laughs> like if no. I was really if I was smarter about it like years ago, I just wasn't. So what do you have right now then? 
in the fleet. And we can end with, with this. <laughs> well, we should tell people how we met. How do we meet? Grinder. No. <laughs> Don't say that. Just a joke. No, we, uh, we met. You, you, ha- you have a TV show. Is that top secret? We're, it's top secret. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you don't have a TV show. We met in... Filming something. We're f- we met filming something. Yeah. And you came to my uh, secret bastardo uh, <laughs> garage. garage yeah, in Jersey. It was my... It was like... I was like, we got it. Because, you know, I was always... Since after we met through Magnus, I started look, watching your Instagram. I was like, oh, this guy's got a collecting thing. I like his thing. <laughs> He's got good... You're like one of the few people I give credit to, like, in terms of, like... <laughs> Watches, cars. I know people give you cut you, you know, they give you flack, but I think you have impeccable. You got to have a certain eye for this stuff. Sure. Like you would tell me, how do you know? I was like, I don't know. I just like what I like. Right. <laughs> like right. I've always been that person. I'm right. gonna wear what I'm gonna wear, and I like what I like. I'm gonna buy what I like. Tomorrow. Right. So it was like it was like kind of like a kinship, in my opinion. Even though we came from two different backgrounds, we still have like respect for you know. For sure. Well, because you, you because we both, I think, um, if we're just gonna briefly talk about how great we are. <laughs> we both like kind of we appreciate the obscure and I think we also I think you also um, you you're like we were saying earlier you, you kind of you don't want to be part of the crowd if everyone's collecting one thing you kind of that turns you off yeah but it's it's not being I think I'm better than anyone it's just always I've always always been like that yeah. So, yeah I don't no, know I'm what it same, is it's I'm like OCD like that it's yeah. like I've never I'm exactly the same way, man. It's not a question of feeling like you're better. It's just a yeah. question of not wanting to be part of the the, the flock, I guess, in ter- from, a, yeah, I think, from a collecting I standpoint. I think or something. for humanity itself, it's like in order for us to move forward, we should be more creative, and I feel like you should have more open... Uh, I know people say you, can have, you should have an open mind. I feel like you should go beyond having an open mind in certain things. So I'm like, I look into things, I'm like, and some things pique my interest. It's like... Okay, it's like this is cool. Like the like the first time I went to Japan, like years ago, I was like, "This place is insane." It's like you can't like someone else. I read an interview. It's the same thing. Like you just get the sense of terror, like your senses are like overloaded when you're out there. Right. Like everything's designed. It's like the manhole covers, the sidewalks, the everything. It's everything like, they, matters. They put thought into everything. Yeah, it's ev- like, everything matters. I'm like, holy cow, this is insane. That's what I loved about Japan, man. It's so interesting you say that because that I just I feel like. Um, We've talked about this, but in the West, things only matter if you want to pay for them to matter. Whereas in yeah. Japan, reflexively, I feel like everything matters. Like you say, everything's designed, everything's considered, and there's a real beauty to to um, to a life like that. I think. I think so too. I think efficiency and stuff like they don't design something for no reason. Like if they design a door, it has another purpose to the door that, that you're like, wow, but I didn't think of that. That's <laughs> right, crazy. Right. It's like stuff like that. I'm like, this is insane. Right. I love it here. It's like, it's awesome. So you came to the garage. Yeah, I came to the garage. So I told the guys that we got to get in touch with Phil. Let's, let's, we got to get him on the show because I'm like, I didn't know what cars you owned at the time. All I knew was you owned one car <laughs> which from, that went viral because Tyler copied that car. So I was like, oh, okay. I know, I know he copied that. I'm at... Do you know he copied? Did he tell you that? I figured it out. I'm like, because your car I saw first a year or two, and then he, I just see him because he comes to the shop. He's a friend of ours. He comes to the shop. We should tell it's Tyler the creator. Yeah. You so know. he's one of our, he's a sweet guy, like super good guy. He also has like uh, you know even though he copied, it, but he on his own accord. But he, he went had, further he had, though. He went further, but he also has his, he has a collective taste too. Like he's yeah. like one of us in that department. He doesn't know I'm like that really, but because I don't tell people, you know what I'm saying? It's yeah. Like, and I don't post anything like so and no one really knows unless you're personally like with me 24 7 yeah okay this is okay now it makes sense you know he's the same way like he's literally the same way he's super smart like well, I, it's interesting because he um we've we've talked a little bit on instagram i mean it's not like we're friends or anything but uh but i <laughs> i mean i really love the fact that he's he's quite radical in his own way like he te- he has a, a a uh, fiat 131 a bath which is a group a rally car mm-hmm. and he painted it uh, is it pink or pink? Yeah. yeah, and I think I think that's fucking amazing. I like love a, like a pastel, pastel pink. Yeah, yeah. yeah. well, all his cars are pastel. So he sh- he sent me like, a couple of months ago. He bought some rolls, like a sev- in yellow, like the most amazing kind of cornflower. He's really yellow. into this first. I think if I if I might be incorrect, but if I can remember correctly. His first cars, collectible cars, were the old rolls. Like he's really into old rolls. Right, but he has the Delta that's baby blue. Alonso yeah, he Delta. Got, yeah, he repainted it baby blue. Yeah, 
You might have another one coming. You might have more than one Delta. <laughs> really? I think so. Yeah. So you saw my Delta yeah. and then and you liked it. And I had mentioned to you that I might be selling it. Well, you guys used it in the video. Well, so Magnus did. Magnus, Magnus did, did, yeah. Yeah, Magnus did it in the video, which I thought was really great because yeah. it was... It we was, weren't friends at the time, but yeah, but Magnus used it in the video. That's right. Yeah, yeah that's right, because he used it in the video. and he, he was, yeah, I was and, surprised. I was like, the hell is not a Porsche? They were like, oh, do you mind if we... I was like, no, I don't care. They filmed... And then I see it's your, the, the car, your car, and I'm mm -hmm. like, I didn't know who you were at the time. I was like, I thought you were going to use a Porsche. <laughs> like he always an outlaw, or like something. But well, that was great, though. I think from a branding, for just from a sort of branding idea, I thought that was a genius stroke for Magnus to do that to not because he always does a Porsche. I was like, you're in New York, you know, it would be an amazing shock if you weren't in a Porsche. That would be so great. That's what, so it was your idea. To no, come. no, no. I, I didn't. Know, I don't know the whole story. I, don't, so. I can't remember. I don't think it was. I can't. I think it was Magnus's idea. I can't remember. You know, what? I'm just going to say it's my idea. Okay. Let's just go with that. We'll keep it. Magnus we'll keep it, listens keep it to everything I, I say. Don't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> don't say anything. I just fax him stuff to do, like a list of things he has to do once a month, and he just okay. does he my just bidding. Does okay. Yeah. <laughs> Good to know. Yeah. The, the dreads, my idea. The multi layers of flannel, <laughs> all my idea. <laughs> That's um, funny. So anyway, I had I had just bought back my 037, my Lancia 037. And so I'm I'm on this kind of OCD kick of I just want each car in the garage to do a specific thing. So I can't have two rally cars in the garage. Okay. So I said to you, I think I'm going to sell the the Delta. This which is, is and by the way, this is when we were all filming. We were filming at the time. Yeah. And you said during the filming process. <laughs> during the filming process. Yeah. And it's and it's you know, the, the Delta is the car that started Viva Bastardo. Yeah. So it's quite like a tough thing to let go of. Um, but I felt like you, I mean, you know, look, I, we know each other. I know that you, I feel like we have a lot of, like you say, we have a lot of things in common. I, I mean, when you sell a car that's kind of, um, that really matters to you, it really matters to you who it goes to. Always. You know what I mean? Like some cars you don't care, but some cars like this car really matters. So... So well, I guess we should announce on the first, on the podcast, Scar bought my Integrale. So all you people. And I paid you, way more than what it's worth. He did not. <laughs> he ripped me I, off. Just I'm so you, the first person Phil's ever ripped off. Because I know he gets ripped off all the time, but I'm the first person. I, listen, just say, well, just so you know, I know two that sold in the high 70s over the last month. And with and not what, with less a, mileage. No, 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 but uh, not not with a full rebuilt um, engine. All the rest. Of it. But anyway. is it add value? I thought keeping in stock would add more value in those cars. Well, I don't know. Actually, it's funny. Me personally, I do. I would. I'd prefer the more power. I mean, if I was buying one, I would prefer the modified engine. Well, uh, done yeah. right. Uh, I would, but well, a little bit, a little bit of bump. I mean, I will. I will say that the stock, a stock, um, a stock. Integrale, I think it needs to have. I've always felt that car needs like fifty or sixty more horsepower. It makes such a difference. Um, I thought I was going to say something of great importance, and I've forgotten what it was. Oh, the, so I guess I should make an announcement on the podcast that everyone who tags me when they see the Bastarda driving around, it's not me driving around. <laughs> it's Scar driving around. Or Kanye, they think it's Kanye. Yeah. Too. <laughs> I see people say it's Kanye, yeah. Look, it's, it's, Tyler. It's, it's, it's not Tyler. It's, yeah, Kanye. it's Scar. So you should tag Scar. Um, but I'm I'm happy that it's kind of close and it's in you know good hands. So thanks for you know buying it. <laughs> Even though I know you think you pay too much. Don't worry, I'll sell it back to you for more. Yeah, you can. <laughs> You're gonna come growling back. Yeah, yeah. I'm not changing anything on it. I'm keeping it. I'm just putting wings in a wide body kit. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm glow, about, no, I'm spinners. Not doing, I'm not doing anything to the car. Just actually taking care of it for once. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a, uh, well, you have to. I know it has a squeaky brakes, which is uh, needed new coilovers, which you're done, right? But, but you've been have you, so you had never driven a Delta before that, right? No, but I've driven the Mark II GT. It's very similar to the, it's like a higher revving, higher, like better performing GTI to me. It feels oh. like that, and it yeah. makes sense because I didn't know the same designer that designed the Giugiaro. GTI, the Giaro. Design the Delta. I was like, oh, okay, now this makes sense. Yeah, but I mean, the thing that's glorious about the Delta, man, is just the the, the steering, like the way it's. Just... But the way it steers is insane. Oh. It's it's hard to explain. I tell people this. I'm like, dude, and it was like on when I was driving, it was on you know, no offense, but like crappy coilovers. <laughs> How dare you? Taiwanese coilovers, <laughs> and I was like, the coilovers. You're like, oh, the ride's so bumpy, and I'm like, because the coilovers are, no, I know, are I not know. good. I know, <laughs> I know the coilovers could, I, I mean, I kind of live with it, um, 
But you, I mean, it's funny. Like it's such a nerdy car thing to talk about. Like it's the steering of a car. Yeah. But it's but it, it's insane. It doesn't even even with driving with the with the even driving on the highway. We, when I drove back on the New Jersey on the on, in Mexico, I was I was flying like. It drove. It Wait, like, Mexico? What? You took the. We call it Mexico. Yeah, we call it. You know, it's some. I don't want to say it on there, but it, <laughs> let's just say we were driving on Mexico. It was going like okay. hundred thousand, a hundred miles an hour. In Mexico. Okay. It was. It felt like a straight line. Like right. it was not losing. It was. In, it was. It was so planted. Yeah. It's. I was like, yo, this is like. It's I mean, amazing. It's right? amazing. <laughs> I mean, it, I mean, like, it's funny because people pe- need to experience this car. Right. It's like this is not, and I've driven a lot of different cars. This is a car that's like. It's an amazing drive. Like it really is. I'm like right. even I was I was like, oh, this is like really an amazing driving car. Yeah, I mean Nothing. you can see why you can see why it's kind of a cult thing now. Um, yeah, and I well, mean, you made it a cult thing apparently, right? You take credit for that, right? Maybe. I don't know, man. I mean, look, you know, <laughs> I, look, I would, I don't. I mean, look, it was always a cult. The only thing I did that was vaguely different, maybe before other people, um, and I'm sure other people it was had actually. Different. Auto flex because people don't know that it's a, the paint that you use is actually a temporary paint. It's yeah, it's auto flex. Yeah, no one knows that. Everyone I always, thinks you change the color. Oh, I always. Just, it looks. It looks like it. auto flex. looks great. I'm like, I don't go, but it's actually temporary. It's just yeah. What, I always. I always. I mean, well, auto flex is amazing, but that's really that was the only. I mean, normally I don't touch the cars. I leave them as stock. But with that car, because it had come from Japan and they'd been painted and all this stuff, it had stuff done to it already. I thought, okay, that sort of gives me permission to make it into something I might be interested in. And there is something amazing about taking old cars and redoing them in contemporary colors. It's kind of shocking. He had it painted white, right? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. It's original color is red. Yeah. And he painted it white in Japan. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But it is, it, it's very interesting. It's kind of like a... Do you know what I mean? Like it's almost like a psychological shock because we're so interested, we're so used to seeing specific cars in period correct colors, yes. like the Integrale, red, yellow, um, I'm, white. I'm not against mods. I, if it's a tasteful mod, I'm like, it improves on on the car. I don't. It's fine. Like, no, I but I, it doesn't I, bother me. But, I, like, but I love. I know that. it bothers a lot of purists, but like right. I'm a pure. I have I have cars that were pure, like I haven't touched, but then you know, I left the stock. But you know, it's like. <clears throat> What's the joy of owning the car if you can't enjoy it? You right. know what I'm saying? It's like those cars then you can't touch <clears> it, <throat> you can't lower it, you can't put like taste. I, I'm totally for tasteful mods like in cars. Oh, I'm the same. That's how I'm a big fan of AMG. They're like they're literally like instead of it be they're modded cars. That's what that's what it is. You know? Right. But I'm I'm I I took I I I'm a, I will fool you. I mean I, I totally agree, man. And the thing well the thing with the Delta was I just I did all it was all reversible stuff. Um, but oddly enough, going back to the Mercedes One Two Four, I would love to see that in a very unusual color, because I've never seen it's always in black or gray. I've never seen one of those silver. Big, yeah, I've never seen one of those in like an interesting modern color. They didn't. They didn't do colors. They really didn't. No, honestly, I've never seen my person. Me, I've never seen the white S Six Hundred. Right. Never. Like growing up. In I mean, New York, how cool? Maybe it? one, I think, but like I don't if I can remember. But I'm always black or, or gray. Right. Even though it was two ton, was always never like a, a navy blue, maybe once in a blue moon. Right. But never like. Do you think that would look good in like a Tyler style, like pastel color? Or would that be just too crazy? The S600? Yeah. No, I think, to be honest with you, if you could find a light gray interior, I think blue would look great. I think forest, like the classic colors of forest green with yeah. tan interior would look great on those. Forest green would be nice on yeah. that. The dark, like gray, per- like pearl that makes it like metallic black looks good. Right. White. White's already like I love white, but I'm like, <laughs> people, so many people doing white cars now. I'm just like, right. I don't know. Yeah, so, but so okay. So now the news is out about the Delta. So what else, do you have? So do you want to talk about it, a bit about other cars you have, or or do you want to talk a little? Are there other are there? Like I had, uh, I'm a huge 996 guy. Like I love, uh, I love the early model 996. Is like the one of my favorite ones is my buddy and I. He has it's a C two uh, ninety nine C two, but it comes with the LSD. <laughs> it comes with like lim- the limitless lib. It has sports seats. It's like it's spec high, you know. What I mean? But it's like it's fun. He changed the he put K and W coilovers. He needs to get these coilovers from Taiwan, man. I could recommend X Y Z is not they're, they're <laughs> terrible. He put K and Ws on it. Like it is. I tell people this car is so much fun to drive. Like. And it's still analog. Like the pedals are still analog. Like because they basically, from what I understand, I could be wrong. The first, the ninety nines and ninety eights, they were really built in ninety eight for sale for ninety nine. 
They were built in the 993. They're basically a 993. The, ch the chassis is basically the 993 chassis, the early models. And then they, with 996 sheet model with the egg, you know, the egg yolk <laughs> lights and stuff. And then they switched production. They put electric pedals, you know, and all that stuff from 2000 on. Okay. So I always knew that. Magnus actually pointed me to it. He's like, they're affordable. No one knows about it. Like, you are, get a you 99, know, get you, the sports seats, get like, I was like, oh, weaseling. Okay. <laughs> you know what, man? I find, I think you have the same thing. There is great pleasure in finding these tiny little truffles that have been buried in the forest that yeah, kind of people have forgotten about. Yeah, like the pre-merger Japan yeah. AMGs. Yeah, like that Tommy Giza. The Tom Tommy Kyra. Tom yeah, yeah, like all like this. Those like, are, they're all going to shoot up. I know they are. Right. Like, if you, if people are like, oh, there's no more deals. And, oh, I'm going to wait till the market crashes. You don't need to wait till the market. If you really want to, if you have the money, you want to buy a car that's definitely going to, there's a good chance it's going to. You know, two words. Explode in value. Maserati Shamal. The Shamal. <laughs> It's okay. a comfortable car. You know what? That, you know <laughs> what I'm going to say? I'm, like, I'm going to tell you this, man. I, we're going to go for a drive, and if you don't get out of that car and say, "Holy shit, this is an amazing car," I will, I will buy you dinner. Okay. At a place of your choice, anywhere in New York. Okay. You get a lot of hate on the Shamal, huh? <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. Well, you know, what well, you mean that? Well, the last, the last. Uh, you know why? Because I'm always bloody defending the Shamal. It's like a, it's like I'm on some kind of crazy. Like I said, Shamal, like the 240SX, this is like the Nissans, it would say 240SX or the S13s. What? It, where, where it says Shamal oh, yeah. on the side, yeah. it looks like a 240SX, the S13s. The S, uh, you mean the, the typography? Yeah. No, the, the whole. Oh, the I whole, see. Like, yeah. No, no I. I... <laughs> I feel like at some point people just could tell me, you know what, Phil, please stop talking about the Shamal. But, <laughs> <'cause>, <laughs> it doesn't because, bother me. Because it's such a... Anyway, I'm, that's, that's my wager to you, man. You go for remember a drive. The, the, remember when we were filming, I was like, the Evo, the Pajero Evo yeah. that you had? I was like, I was like, you probably paid 30 for it, right? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to put it on the camera. But he's like, because that was the market at the time. Yeah. I was like, they're going to shoot up in value. And you were like... Yeah, I'm like, they're really going to shoot up in value because I was looking for, I was looking for one too. My buddy in Japan, that's his favorite car too. Right. But I wanted one like, I didn't want one silver. I wanted one like white. So it looked like a Gundam, you oh, know? No. <laughs> like oh, with the, with the, right, right, yeah, right, cause yeah, it, yeah. I wanted a white one that, right. would, that, because they call them Gundam. So I'm like, I wanted a white one that looks like a Gundam. Right. So See, but that's a perfect example. Talking of what, now, they're worth like fifty, by the way. If anyone's no, one. I, no, I, they're actually the, some <laughs> guy. Gone up, yeah. Some guy offered me one uh, stick with one hundred and ten thousand miles for sixty-five grand the other day. But here's the thing: I mean, to, to, to you, and, and if no one knows, the Pajero Evos are probably the best SUVs ever built, and no one knows about them. <laughs> like literally think, for everything. Do you think? Well, hang on, just to to your point earlier, man, about you don't have to, you, it's not a question of the market crashing, it's a question of finding the little truffles in the forest. Mm -hmm. The Pajero Evo was a perfect example of that. There was a car that was 25 grand, 30 grand, uh, I mean, if unless and for you didn't years. buy, you didn't buy it, you just bought it like a year, less than a year ago. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, there you go, see? What, right. You'll find, all it takes is just, it's either someone po posting about it, someone talking about it, someone more, way more famous than you. Mostly, <laughs> talk, then so what, the car will go over her. So like, what uh, do you think there are, what, what, uh, what, if you can reveal, are there any truffles that you can reveal that you're interested in? Uh, right <laughs> now, the pre-merger okay. AMG Japan, the, only Japan. Those right. are the ones I'm just like obsessed about right, right. now. Uh, those are, those are definitely those. Uh, special JDM cars. People are like, oh, the JDM market, but they folk, people that hate on the JDM market, they focus on only certain aspects of the, of the car because it's you know the youth the youth are huge into jd they're huge into skyline supers again like <clears throat> s13s like i my brother has a he's building an s13 now with engines like the really well-built cars they've lasted 30 years i'm like and they're different they're, they're a completely different driving experience to, to than than anything else like every car is different like you understand what i'm saying so yeah. it's like like i grew up i got into cars. my first car was actually an accurate integral like that's a good car. GT, uh, uh, GTR. That was my favorite car. Sure. So it was like, you know, it was a great car. People, you know, that, you know, throughout the years, people were like, oh, that's a rice rocket or whatever. I'm like, it's a great car. I don't, you know what car? Civic hatchbacks are okay. amazing. Too. Okay. On the, on the SUV thing, you know, <laughs> car I really love, and I would kind of like to do a resto mod of it. <laughs> if, I don't even know if you remember this. The Isuzu Vehicross. Yeah, the vehicle. They're amazing. Oh, you, I always love I fucking love that, that car, beautiful man. Car. I mean, what an amazing design. Stock is fine. It's like finally, but they look awesome. I've seen some that have been like 
bigger t- they look so much w- like with bigger tires yeah yeah like with, they look yeah. not not even raised up it's just bigger yeah. tires on the, on, yeah. on the, it, they look amazing i mean, I, look. I i i don't know what that's funny like, i was looking at a bank across last year so <laughs> like, i saw one on like cars and business yeah. i was like Whoa, this what, what do they go for Sixteen thousand, fifteen thousand. Those are gonna go up in price still. They're genius, man. They're really well built. Halsies? Well, no. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Come on, man. I I love them. I I, I, I think, think they're gorgeous. I, I just the one that was a car. I didn't like it because it was gray. I was I was like, I don't. Want you mean silver? Or so sil- no, it was gray. I think it was a dark oh, gray. I, see. I was like, I'm not into this. But dark if you look at that car, it's an utterly radical design. It is. It's an amazing. I mean, it was a, actually really well built too. It's a crazy piece of design. I mean, there was nothing. You know, it's so interesting. Like you, you just kind of like we were talking about these little truffles. Like that, that was radical. Suzuki, and it's still side, radical. Suzuki sidekicks, I love too. Geo trackers, those are all cool. <laughs> oh my god, the geo tracker yeah, was that cool, tiny? But it's really a Suzuki sidekick, right? People are like, oh, it's a you know, geo. Those geo trackers were actually rebadged to Suzuki. It was sidekick. a two door, right? Yeah, yeah. Those geos with the some guys in our neighborhood. You don't see them in our neighborhood. They have yeah, yeah, a couple. Yeah. The yellow and There's black. There's a yellow one. one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah They're a car club, that. New Day Car Club. You should have them on the show. What what's he what is that? They're called New Day Car Club. They just collect Geo junk, trackers. Junkers, yeah. <laughs> really? like, high mod, they don't care. It's like, yeah. They started on two of them live across the street from the shop. And one of them, Lucky, he owns a gallery right on Ludlow Street. Oh yeah. In the middle of the block. He's yeah. cool. He grew up in New York too. Yeah. So it's he they're they're, they're it's cool that they started a, they started the car that, club like three, four years there's ago. There's a there's a two door G Wagon that parks out on the street that on across from your shop sometimes. I don't you see it. Wait a minute! You're telling me that the Pajero Evo is better built than a Pajero and an, a G wagon. Yeah. <laughs> really? Yes. <laughs> How come? It's solid because it's, was it, they didn't they use it in the rallies? Yeah. You got to be. It's, it's. I think it's a amalgamation. Oh, yeah, it's a amalgamation. Amalgamation. <laughs> I know it's okay. a mouthful. It's a, yeah, really. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's way better built. It's got. All, I mean, I don't know. It's got all sorts of stuff in there, but I don't know what the stuff is. You got to start driving <laughs> in the city. People I know. go crazy. I know it. Well, well, you when should I, auto flex that to white. If I were you, actually, you know what I was gonna do? Uh, ivory. Ivory will look cool. Here's what I was thinking: is I was gonna, I was gonna ask someone. I was gonna try and have someone design, like, imagine if Viva Bastardo, the company, existed in the '90s and was sponsoring a Paris Dakar Pajero Evo. What would the livery be? On that car, yeah, that would be interesting. Oh, that, that's that's the scar. That's the yeah. shit idea. That's what that sounds. Like. That's what that is. Just paint it white. Interesting. Just paint it white. Yeah, it, it does look good in white. Or, or like a bone white, or or like not a cream, but like a bone ivory, like a metallic white. It needs to sound better though. You get a real muffler. <laughs> that's, all, that's all it is. I know. Well, I you got might it. have to straight pipe it, but. I got. I put an exhaust on it, but it still doesn't. It still doesn't sound very good. But it's surprisingly fun to drive. And I will say that I've never. I've never been into trucks or SUVs and stuff. I feel like I always like wagons. We have that wagon. Yeah, I'm a wagon dude. Yeah, all the I've way. Always man. been a wagon. But I when I when I drive the Pajero around, and I was in, trying to tell you too. It's like Americans most do not like wagons. Never like like in the last twenty years. Like they don't like wagons or why? hatches. I have no idea. Okay, so Euros, like people from Europe love their wagons and hatchbacks. Like so. Um, they love it's either four door sedan, two door sedan in America, or an SUV. Right, and SUVs aren't popular in Europe. So, so you, what's your ideal? Uh, what's your fave wagon? Uh, <laughs> the W one two four. Those Audis, all the Audis, the RS, like the, all the RS from back in the days. Um, I love. I love Audi was actually probably my favorite out of all of the whole. You know, not the modern stuff that like the stuff you drive now, but like right. No <laughs> stuff from like early two thousands. Yeah. Weirdly, this is and this is maybe a super peak geezer. You know that? Do you know a guy called Alexander Kraft on Instagram? He's some guy. Uh, he's he lives this kind of glorious lifestyle he, in France. He's got like a he runs. I think he runs Sotheby's France or something. But he has he took a Volvo wagon from the eighties, the Brick. Okay, and then he just. Tot- what was it cool? The old school. I love the brick well, yeah, wagon. Yeah. To me, that's the one I like. But, but the sharp lines. I like, uh, yeah, I like. amazing. Those, those but, what, are, but what he did was he painted this really beautiful green color. He redid the interior in this incredible like brown leather. He's got white walls on it, like a rack, roof rack made of rattan on it. So it's beautiful. It's just kind of amazing looking. I mean, really? I'm sure it drives like, it. like balls, but it just looks... I'll send you a picture, man. It looks amazing. They had souped up versions of the V90s and stuff. 
My, oh. my brother loved my brother loved that was one of my brother's favorite cars you know? that's what I was actually last year he, loved, he loves wagons too manual like stick shift from wagons that's his thing he that's loved. what I was looking for man last year I was looking for the Volvo um, V90 T no the one right before that the one they made super they homologated that came in banana yellow yeah the it, it's not type bar it's like type something yeah, I, know, like, I know we're talking yeah. oh, those are cool those, are, oh, those, those are hard to find though I know I found one once it was like for uh, my brother was looking for it it was like 180,000 miles I was like how the fuck are you put that in? oh yeah no car. those I mean everyone it's I've looked at mileage. yeah it's, it's <laughs> actually the Pajeros are like that all the Pajeros I see for the most part are like 190,000 kilometers to 10,000 kilometers I mean they're crazy mile you can't find white because I've been looking for a white one forever for Pajero yeah. yeah man but look you, I feel like my feeling about buying rare cars is at some point you, you kind of have to just take what take, you're given yeah and just because otherwise, and otherwise yeah, yeah exactly auto -flex. Mm -hmm. you auto flex it because otherwise if you're always waiting for the right color then you end the, you know the market will wake up and then you've missed the boat that's true that's my you're gonna auto flex the for Jerry you should auto flex the white that one you should auto flex I know I think you drive it more if you auto flex the white <laughs> well that one I could just probably wrap yeah whatever it yeah whatever works no, you're right. I mean, it is super cool. The, the Pajero, it's it's actually there are cars in sort of in the last in the car history in the last ten or 30, twenty years, where it's just shocking. The design, you, you look at it and go, "Holy shit! How did they like? How did this get through? Like yeah. the, you know what I mean? Like the like the the Isuzu Veycross. Like you think, how did that end up being produced? Because it's so crazy looking. And the, it's, Azte the Aztec. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, but that's the other way. The Aztec. Oh. I actually would love to have the guy who designed the Aztec on. It's ugly. It is no. It's <laughs> that a, was that was a car. Where they definitely were like, let's do something completely different. Right. And it make and they did not know what the fuck they were doing, and they just threw that. That car. I've always hated that car. <laughs> Everyone hates that car, but that's kind of what. <laughs> so I'm so fascinated. I mean, I remember. I remember in period the ads they talked about like didn't they have like um like a thing in the back you could un, you could roll you could camp in or something like it was for you know it was for college kids I think so yeah I think right? the back maybe went yeah. up or something yeah, yeah. Uh, but the 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 Pajero is kind of like that like you look at that and the designs like those crazy fins on I the mean back. they were called they didn't never had the two door I think in the states but the Ford they had a four door version of Monteros right. those were really popular back then right people loved the Montero back is then. that your your phone's buzzing oh sorry <laughs> It's a high level. Uh, it's Tyler, the creator. He's calling in. It's Magnus to say, <laughs> don't check your voicemail, man. <laughs> yeah. It's just worse, though. I'm sorry. No worries, man. So, okay. So finally, man. Um, so when you came to the garage when we first met, you were wearing a Rolex. But now you're wearing this really... I fucking love this thing. Oh, this thing! I felt, I saw it. I was like, I gotta get this. This thing's genius, man. Yeah. So it's a Cartier. Do you know? Even know? I don't even know what. It's like, a Gondol. Okay. From seventy four, I think. It's just, it's I mean, it's not exact years, but it's from the seventies. It is great, man. I feel like you. I mean, you know, I'm a big fan of the seventies. Yeah, I'm, I'm into <laughs> me and some friends. We're all into like vintage Cartiers with Parisian styles, with Paris mm -hmm. Paris styles. Uh, well, I don't even know what that is, man. What? what so basically, this is genius. I might be wrong. Because I'm learning as they go. But um, at the bottom of the dial, yeah, it says where it's, the dial was made, Paris. Oh, I see. So okay. Cartier is from Paris, so right. everyone they didn't make a lot of these Parisian dial ones. Now it's Swiss made, which is the service dial, or Swiss, which is made. You know, they made them in Switzerland. Obviously okay. In Switzerland. Okay. So I, I'm not 100 percent sure, but I don't think they do Parisian dials anymore. They so stopped it, doing it. So is that like a? Is it? Is it? Is that? Because I know you you a bit of a Rolex geezer, right? Uh yeah. Mm. <laughs> <Kinda. laughs> so do you think you're like are you now a 70s uh, Cartier Giza I'm or? going more into leather leather band uh, I'm a leather band guy you don't like the uh, integrated bracelet situation no I don't mind a metal bracelet like it's fine it's not, it's not I mean do you think a Nautilus fan but, yeah. can I persuade you do you think I can persuade you to get into 70s Patek stuff and don't mind the oh, by the way don't mind the strap I know you got a, you got new ones coming John was so strapped so I'm, like, I'm just <laughs> all, waiting on all it. the way yeah these are this is the this is the strap I love that thing man it's so, it's, it's great just, it looks it's, great thing. but the size is amazing because also the size also is also pretty... getting a little bit of a rose rose gold patina on it oh all, right all the time yeah this is yeah. with all the old school eighteen karat gold that starts going a little rosy yeah that's nice man which I love so is there anything you're looking at now or are you just Come across. Uh, I was actually looking at the one you were wearing. <laughs> oh, the, <laughs> the it. So this is a thirty-seven seventy for people who aren't watching the amazing YouTube show. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, uh, it's funny. It's a bit of a love hate cool. for people. The story is cool though, because the story of the watch is actually if people would actually look into it, it's like for, for people out there, it's like no one understood that Nautilus wasn't a popular thing for a long time. Nobody, which is thought. inconceivable. People to because, think about yeah, now. now. Now it's the hottest watch in the book. Right. Back, even back in the eighties, like nobody was buying Nautilus. Nobody liked them. So they that that was the most popular watch at the well, time. Well, what was happening was people were buying. Uh, um, Ellipses. Yeah. The Ellipse was the... Was the hottest the, watch they had on yeah. the market at the time, which is interesting. So what they were doing, it was like, you know what? Let's get an Ellipse. Let's get a Nautilus bracelet, Frankenstein them and sell them. Right. The 37th well, because was this was one. supposed to be a sport Ellipse. Yeah. And this was that's what that was. And as you say, the Ellipse was the most popular watch. Um, and, <laughs> and now what's funny is because people are so used to seeing Nautilus. a Nautilus, this looks weird proportionally to people because <laughs> yeah. their eyes are trained to see the Nautilus proportions. Yeah. The eyes are stretched out Nautilus. Yeah, exactly. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I post it, people go, why the long face? Oh, I <laughs> so I, It looks, it, honestly, it fits great like on people. I think it looks great. Thanks, man. The two tones are actually beautiful. I think the two-tone's really nice. I think old school paddock, people are like, I have friends, most of them, they're like, I hate two-tone. Like, I would never buy it. I fuck two-tone. Like, they always like hate it. I personally love the vintage AP and vintage paddock two-tones. I think the gold with this, the gold they used back in that era the, for two-tone, like when they use, so basically, let's just say a, a Nautilus, a 3700 you want it. They would use, it would be a two-tone. It would be the pellet would be a, the pellet label right. would be a t- one color, and then the <laughs> dial hand, then the dial would be one color, and then the yeah. gold, the markers would be gold yeah. on the on the face. And I'm like, that's so fucking. I'm, sick. I love I love old two-tone. I'm with you, man. I think particularly 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s two-tones, beautiful. And I think the reason why for me is because um, the watches were more delicate, and I think they felt more a little bit more like jewelry in a way, and so the two-tone works better. Because now with two tone, everything is massive. Everything's kind of bulky, heavy, dense. yeah. <clears throat> and so it's not subtle. No, and, the, and color, it, the coloration's off too. It's like right. they use a different. My buddy was saying like Rolex has their own. You know, they have their own gold mines, their own you know, minimum. <laughs> right. They to do their own gold. He's like, oh, they're probably mixing more rod- rhodium into the gold mixture now in the last like five ten oh, years. Oh, interesting. Okay, to make it cheaper. To make it cheaper for them, and right. then but that's where the eighteen karat. If you grab an eighteen karat modern one compared to a vintage one. It's night and day difference. Like you, right. you know, the shades are, the shades are way nicer on the old on the vintage one than they are in the new yeah. one. I don't like modern. Like you should get a Midas, man. I've always wanted a Midas. You then should, you, then you got it. I was like, no, nah, I'm, like, <laughs> I'm ruined. Always it. wanted. A I'm ruined. I totally always wanted a stoned out Midas too. I'm uh, like, like on a strap or or the the full the full you? thing, and then. Every, it's like you got it. The only reason I wanted it was Elvis had one. That's the only reason I wanted one. Well, he, the, the, well, that one they didn't make a that one they didn't make stone dials of the original Midas the asymmetrical dial. They okay. made they made uh, eight hundred total of which one hundred were white gold and the rest were yellow gold. And then after that they made all these variations. They made Cellini versions with stone dials, coral dials, lapis dials. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. So you could, I could totally see you wearing. You could, you could get one of those Midas. Someone was wearing a Midas on a strap. It was a Cellini Midas, and it was amazing because they made crazy dials and oh, like yeah. ribbed cases and all sorts of stuff. The Cellini stuff is cool too. Yeah, my friend has one. She she inherited from her dad, and I was like, this is pretty cool. It's like, amazing. She was like, what do you think? Because she was they, at the time. This was like eight years ago. She was like. Oh, my dad gave me this little roll, like the Cellini. It was really cool, and I'm like, "What was it? A stone dial?" No, I don't think so. No, I don't remember exactly. It's the girl that I don't, one of the girls that don't coming soon, Fabiana. Okay. It's, and I remember when she first got it, and she was like, "Well, it's not really a sub." We're like, "I'm like, girl, it's like it's it's, actually, it's still it's like really cool. I, like, it's cool I, that it's been in your family too. I think. Yeah. I feel like you should get one, man. I feel like that's totally your steez. I'm looking at old school Omegas, like Scarface gold Omegas. That's what I'm like. <laughs> Is that what he wore? Uh, Escobar used to wear uh, vintage, like old school car. He all wore, it's basically, outside of the Rolexes, he was also wore a lot of Cartiers. Do you, <laughs> do you think that's why people like him? Because he made it cool? Or the Cartier, rather? Do you think that Escobar secretly, an, he, he was like an inf, a Cartier influencer? He was a watch guy, though. A yeah. lot of people back in those in that era, was, they were a lot of, there was a lot of watch. My cousin had paddocks when I was a kid. And like, you know right. what I'm saying? That was unheard of, you know? Right. Emilio from Bellotto, he has paddocks. Like, we all... Emilio who? What? The guy that owns Bellotto. Oh, I see. Yeah, he, he, oh, he, he, was the, he was the first one to introduce me to, like, the, he's the guy that introduced me to vintage watches. The guys would come with the vintage watches. It wasn't huge. Right. So he would have, This is like, the 90s, right? This is the... Yeah, late yeah. 90s. So he would always have a huge... Tiffany... 
Tiffany Dell stuff. At, yeah, under market, like he would always like he has a crazy, crazy collection. I mean, he might he might still have it. I don't know, but like Why he has give him a cool man. See if uh, he wants to like, go a few pieces. <laughs> <laughs> he likes he likes the bougie stuff though. Like what's the bougie stuff? You know the higher end stuff from is, Well, isn't this bougie? All this stuff. This is normal stuff. <laughs> he likes the bougie stuff. But yeah, he, he he got me. He's the one that really got me into it. Because he, he explained it to me. He's like, they're already going to go up in value. You gotta, you're you not going to regret it. And that's when I started like falling in line with it. Because before that, I would wear Casio or like whatever. I actually just bought a Casio the other day. Did I show you that one? Yeah. With the, that was cool. <laughs> with the pearl dial. They, they're cool. I like yeah. vintage watches. I like vintage Casios. They're yeah. cool. They, they they have some a lot of eclectic. I'm trying to find a, a McNally Keith McNally signed Swatch watch. That's what I really want. Who's Keith McNally? Not Keith McNally. I'm sorry, Keith Haring. <laughs> Keith Haring. Oh. <laughs> Keith we McNally, the Balthazar guy. Yeah, yeah, not yeah Balthazar did a line of watches, the Pastis no, watch. No, no, no. <laughs> Keith uh, Keith Haring autographed watch. I know he autographed a bunch because he used to do signings when. But they, like oh like real autograph. Like real, yeah, because I know oh. he. So I I bought a bunch of his prints like the. Pop up posters. He used to do pop up posters with Swats. Like, oh, autograph signing with yeah. Keith Haring for this new release that he designed, and he signed the poster. So I want to get the watch. That, that oh, he that's amazing! Yeah, which is cool. The poster was cheap. I bought it for like a hundred bucks. <laughs> I was like, it's a Keith Haring like poster, designed like, and actually, signed poster, like fully signed by him. Yeah, designed and full. Killer, yeah, designed and signed by him. Are you an art geezer? Getting into it though. Yeah, I was never really into it. No, I'm getting into it now. Now that I'm understanding it a little more. Well, any kind of anything in particular? A uh, buddy of mine, he owns a gallery of like my wife's, um, one of her best friends, Robbie Fitzpatrick. He owns a gallery, Fitzpatrick Gallery in Paris. And he's teaching us how to collect art. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, then I, mean, I have an, another friend, Gardy St. Pierre. He sells art. Uh, he sells a lot of black art to uh, NBA stars and stuff like that. He's, a, you know, I'm sure people that listen to him know who he is too. He's a good friend. He's also helping me out. So, what stuff are you looking at? Uh, up, a lot of up and coming people. There's well, one person that we bought. His you name can't. You can't. You can't start off buying Picasso. <laughs> no, there's a guy called Chino that was blowing up. We we paid last year and like five thousand bucks or three thousand or three thousand for a piece. Now it's worth fifty. <laughs> so it's like he's blowing up little. Oh, uh, what kind of art is it? Uh, modern stuff. And then there's uh, another <laughs> artist too. That, that is very specific. <laughs> I'm not, like I said, is I'm, I'm learning this stuff. Is it oils? Is it a photograph? I know that stuff. It's oil. It's okay. Oil. All right. That's it's good, man. So you are off to a good start. <laughs> then uh, the other artist we're looking to buy a piece from is one of the Olsen twins' boyfriends. He's, he's blown up too. <laughs> he, no, I'm serious. Like, okay. He's like, I forgot his name. <laughs> That's just how he's known. Yeah, he's blown up. Like, Robbie represents all these. Like, he works with these guys. He represents Do you think them. that's how he introduces himself? Yeah. I'm the Olsen twins' boyfriend. <laughs> Maybe. He dates one of them, not both. <laughs> <laughs> that's, all you, that's all you know. Yeah. But he's that dude. If you Google him, I forgot his name. He's he's coming up. He's probably really good. Per- Want to buy while it's still affordable. So there's a lot of amazing stuff in Japan. Oh yeah. <laughs> I would when I used to go there on business a lot. I would buy art. I would go to student shows and buy art. Yeah, they have the paper they use. The everything. But everything's it, amazing. Like, but oh. I just, I just, it's so interesting how. Um, I guess every country is like that in some way or another. But if you live in the West. Japan is such a its own extraordinary, unique bubble uh, and sort of self-contained bubble of ideas and this influences and aesthetics. That if you come from somewhere like the States, it's so um, it's so surprising in the best possible way. Yeah, and I don't want it. It's a friend of mine, famous dude in Japan. I ran into him at a, at a izakaya when I was there in June. We had a blast. We were talking, and he re- explained it like. He, we were talking about the culture, and, and he was asking me like, "Oh, why do you, you know, I'm curious?" And I was like, "No, I just love the people and all that." And then someone there was like, "Oh, they should, because you know, it's kind of the fastest country. Japan, no one knows this, and people are more like they live too much by the culture of Japan, in J- Japan, in J- Japan in like Japan? the salaryman culture, like all the stuff. Everything's like hard line in a sense. So he's like, "Look, it's a double edged sword. It's like if you want people to be more." free with their emotions, free with everything else out there, then you're not going to have what makes Japan special. Right. Well, I guess the... So it's the, like, it is a double-edged sword in that aspect, you know? Well, the thing that, that, that I guess makes it extraordinary is because it's quite insular. It's resisted. Super insular. It's, it's resisted. Um, like the sad thing about Instagram, in a way, I think you and I were talking about this the other day, is that is that because we see everything and everyone sees everything, then 
we all begin to look alike. We all begin to like the same things. We all begin to follow exactly. the same things. And, and, and not, I mean, and, and I guess that happens to some degree there too, but, but from an artistic perspective, there's something interesting happening there that doesn't, I don't see in other and Western that's countries. What's, and that's in general, like when you were asking me earlier about downtown, do you think it's changed? I was like, yeah, it has changed. It's not, I don't find it as interesting as I used to find it. Like, I used to be like, I'll never leave the city. I love downtown. I'm never going north of 14th Street. <laughs> right. that. But I'm like, I, and it's not because I'm older now. It's just, you know what I'm saying? There's people that were twice my age that still lived, loved when I was growing up. They were like, I was like 18, 19. And these guys were 50. And like, they still would never leave New York. And they still, you know, they're like, no, this is where everything, a lot of people like that. So it has nothing to do with me being older now. It's like, right. or us being older. It's just, it just sucks to say. It's just the creative People that I've noticed, even the younger generation, they they're not creative and, and hustlers, and that's you get what I'm saying. It's like they don't, they just they, they just want to just do drugs all day now, it's like, <laughs> and not do anything. Just go, you right. know what I'm saying? It's like it's just there's no creativity, you know. It's like let's do a Soho loft party, let's do a Brooklyn loft party, like you know what I'm right. saying? It's like just they just throw a party, just to throw a party, and it's. So you're saying know. you feel like, <clears throat> well, I mean, look. Do you feel like you feel like people don't want to make they don't want to make something of themselves so much? Is that your? That's what I kind of feel like. They're just they're comfortable. You know, maybe they're financially. We don't know what the situations are, but now they're like, it's like I tell someone. It's like Madonna came to New York with nothing from Pennsylvania, right? Yeah, she lived in the hood, in the Lower East Side. No sure. one knows this. She was yeah. dating all the gangbangers and drug dealers down there, hooking up with all of them before she became a star. Right. But she never had, she never stopped. She always knew that she wanted what she wanted, like even when she didn't have anything. She's always like, I came to New York to make something of myself and I'm not going to stop until I make something out of myself. And she's yeah. just one story out of, of the zillion people that used to come here. You're, si you're quite similar though, man. I mean, what's interesting about you is every time I run into you, you're like, yeah, you know, I met this guy in from Dubai and now I'm going over to stay at his house in Dubai for two weeks or I'm like, well, you know yeah. yeah I met this guy in Tokyo and now I'm doing whatever I mean you're very you're very porous in that I'm way. just like you know what is my family like I've been fortunate and blessed to be with people that I first of all like to listen to people always let people talk and like listen to them and I was always fortunate to be at this at the right time the right place at the right time and like to sit there and listen to them and I just I always got along with everybody from all growing up here. Like, you don't have that anymore. Like, I was exposed to, I used to be in the hood and then go to a millionaire's apartment. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It was like, right. you know, it's like I'd go to a huge, you know, two-story part, like, and hang out with the owner. Like, you know, and I never asked him for anything. Like, never bothered them. Because I was, I, I'm not a person that asks for favors either. So it's like, if they, and I would give my shirt off my back to people. But I never wanted to bother people growing up. So it's like, I'm well, not impressed by anything. So it's, you know, <laughs> I mean, well, right place, right time. Um, that's a combination of a lot of things. It's a combination of luck, but it's, it's also just, it's also a combination of elasticity on your part, porousness, the idea, the openness. Like you know, that's how you end up being in the right place at the right time because you're you're. You can't be so in, 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 like with other people. It's like I respect. Like I went to school with people from every race and every you know culture. Like and you just learn. Like my family is all mixed now, so it's like right. You got to, you know, you got to understand, like, I go to Japan, I have a great time because I respect their culture. I don't go there and implement my culture on them. You know sure. what I'm saying? Like, a lot of tourists do. That's why people hate Americans in Europe and people hate Americans everywhere else. <laughs> it's not, it's like, oh, they're racist. I'm like, they're not racist. They don't like our culture. Like, that's what it is. Right. It's like, we go, we, and it's kind of understandable because in Japan, like, they wait at the light until, even if there's not a car coming. Right. They're not on their cell phones. Right. They wait till the light says walk, and then you walk. Right. You know what I'm saying? Sure. Americans are like, hey, get you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> right. jumping through traffic, cars right. piling through. They don't care. Like, oh, there is a level of respect. Yeah. And if you don't, if you're eating, if you're doing stuff like that in in Japan, then you know it's frowned upon, and then they're like, oh, Americans. publicly, yeah, publicly, yeah, because they're trying to implement. Last time I went there for my fiftieth, and uh, it was it was it was. I used to go, as I said, I used to go a lot for work in the late nineties. But when I went for my 50th, it was the most amazing trip. Uh, but I remember so clearly um, there was a guy walking in front of us and he saw, and he saw a piece of like trash on the ground and he picked it up, put it in his pocket 
Yeah, that's in what Tokyo. They, they do it all the just time. because there's no trash in the street. But yeah, they, well, they, you know what's amazing? There are no trash bins in the street. No, no, there's you no, got to carry because no one dump it in the Seven Eleven, a comedy store, or you got to take it home with you. <laughs> yeah, the yeah. Trash. which you is kind, and it's this, it's that's kind of a beautiful way to to. There's respect. The thing is that people that have never been, they hear it's like they're racist. I hear it from friends. I've never been. I go, they're racist. Not like they don't want us. I say, no, they don't want our culture. It's different. It's not because of our skin. They love me when I'm over there. They, it's the only place where I've actually in the world that I've ever been to that actually I could put my guard down and feel safe. Like I don't feel like some a cops gonna, you know, beat me up or like sure. someone I don't know that has a problem. I'm like, oh, you right. know. Like I can, you can literally put your. You can walk around with a thousand well, actually, dollar chain you know, and nobody it's, it's, Well, here's it, it's, here's the fascinating thing about what you just said, man. And this is the thing I feel about being in Japan, um, is that what happens when you live in New York is is that a large amount of your processing power in your brain is always working to go, you know, oh, look, that guy looks dodgy, or what's happening here, <laughs> or I've got to cross the street, or there's a rat trying to attack me, or whatever it is. There's always some part of your brain that's, that's doing threat assessment, yeah. right? And when you go to Japan, you suddenly go, oh, like a third of my brain that was doing threat assessment no longer has to do that anymore. No, it doesn't. You don't have to. It's, and it's a great feeling. It yeah. really is an amazing Great feeling. Sure. And that, and it's like, you know, I tell people, it's like, it's not like they're busting your ass on stuff. Like, every, there's so many rules. No, it's the way the people act. They don't, they're not, it's not by, it's not a law. It's, right. the, it's, they're, that's how they are. Well, that look, I mean, that's a double-edged like, sword, but it's social cohesion. Yeah, it is. Which we, like, don't, we don't have any social cohesion yeah, in it's the like States. You go to Singapore, whatever, you spit on the street, spit gum on the street, you get a fine or whatever. It's not like that. It's sure. just the people, like, there's laws for, to control yeah, like over there, there's not there's, the laws don't control. It. That's how the people are raised, you know. It's like, right. I don't know. I, I love it over there. I'm like the food is amazing. It's like you eat well out there. It's so you you're moving. I think so. <laughs> really? <laughs> Thanks, so. man. Yeah. Oh, I'd be so jealous, man. I would actually love to spend like, I don't know. We're we're gonna open out there some spots so. in Tokyo. Yeah, we're working on a lot in Japan right now. So for the brand, I know we only have one shop right now, but there's a lot going on behind the scenes. That's amazing, man. Yeah, which I'm trying to. My wife and I were like, we're just. She's into it too. Oh, she loves it. All. Yeah, she's traveling. So she, she's her dad's a diplomat. So she lived in Beijing. Oh, fantastic! Her dad is the reason why we've had free trade with China. He's one of the architects of that deal. No, he really is. really. Yeah, that's why she lived in Beijing <laughs> when she was young. I thought that was my idea, man. <laughs> Wait a minute, hang on. <laughs> yeah, well, he was he was. They lived there for four years while he did that deal. Um, they lived in South Korea. They lived in. Me she went to high school in Mexico City, and then she went to. We met when she was a senior at NYU here. So she has, she's traveled the world like Pakistan and everywhere like China. Right. So she knows every culture. She she loves Japan. She just like she's like this is my favorite place in the world too. And I'm like, you're lucky, man. Yeah, we That's have good. We met good people out there. It's like we have a good a good cool like connection of people out there so it's it's cool it's like it's really cool i like we love it my dubai friends love it too <laughs> they love it out there too so it's like everyone, if you go out there even if it's like i don't recommend it for people like if you're gonna go out there and like get wasted and do drugs that's not the place to do it but if you want to go there and explore learn art and like learn like culture like real culture and stuff and like when you're older it's more for people like between 25 and 30. They're in like old, 25 and up. You're going to say 25 and 35, and then you realize you're talking no, to the 20, geezer. <laughs> and you're yeah, like, oh shit, wait, up. wait Phil is like, like 62. Yeah, 25 and Phil. I mean, that's, I'm disappointed, man, because uh, I would like just to go there and get wasted and do drugs. So you know, now I you, mean you could, but it's you know, you've, I uh, now, it, now you've really ruined everything for me. <laughs> I mean, you can still get drunk on there. So. <laughs> Well, Getting drunk out there is fun. I'd stay, like, I'm not, like, I don't, like, last night I did go because my sister-in-law was in town, but, like, I don't stay up to, like, out drink until, anymore until, like, 12. Like, I'm in bed by, like, 10, 30, 11 o'clock. Watching TV. Knitting. I go to, <clears throat> I go to Japan, I'm out till, like, 2, 3 in the morning, my wife's driving. Like, what are you doing? It's just I'm having... Right, it's a sensory overload. I don't have the energy to stay up. It's right. from, it's, well, it's because wild. also, well, also, it's, like, like, there's so, it's just different. There's so much. It, it's all, you know, it's new experiences you, you want to sponge. Up. I don't walk miles anymore. Like over there, I'm walking like ten miles a day, like night day. It's awesome. It's like this is great. It's like you get your exercise in. It's like, like you're saying, yeah. It's like sensory. It's like there's always something to do out there. There's actually an amazing feed on Instagram of super drunk salary men. <laughs> Oh, I didn't. You know what's funny? The first time I went, I didn't see one. The last time I went, the second time I went, I was like, 
It was I literally almost stepped on one guy. Yeah, I didn't see well, him. He I, was like I, next. He was hugging a pole yeah, on the ground. Yeah, and he was like <laughs> pass it out. And I, my friend said, "Look out!" And I was like, "Oh shit!" I almost stepped on. Him. There's a whole. I remember when I was when I was there for work. There would always be like a, a couple of guys like lying on the sidewalk at night next near the train station with their suitcase and like their brolly or whatever it was but you know just like all the, <laughs> no one would bother them they wouldn't it was it was anyway it was I, the, even the homeless if you try to give them money the food they won't take it they're too proud <clears throat> it's, it's it's yeah yeah it's, it's strange i was like oh. i was like you don't want my money it's fine <laughs> they're like oh. it's a, they consider it an insult <clears throat> well look on that note man we've been blathering for a while this so, is probably the longest one interview we've had. I, <laughs> it is the longest one, yeah. fueled by caffeine. Um, look, man, I just want to say again, Scar, thank you so much for coming in, man. It's thank been, you, man. It's, been it's been a total. Fun. It's been yeah, it's been a real delight, man. And uh, I yeah. want to see what you, you have a. Just to finish, you have the new joint is opening in, on Orchard. Yeah, uh, I think the end of the month. Okay, end of November, beginning of December, hopefully. All right. We'll see. Well, everyone check it out. Scar's Please. Pizza. And <laughs> thanks again for coming, man. It was great. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. All right. <laughs>